Welcome back to the sweatshop boys and girls. Today we're going to be working on a 2011 Subaru Outback. The issue with the Outback is that it's got a leak from the radiator. Your first step is going to be to open the hood. Go ahead and slide this tab over to the right side of the vehicle. As you can see, besides the radiator, the engine bay is in quite a dirty state, so we're going to be remedying that by power washing the engine bay. Of course, before I get started with today's video, do me a big favor and hit that subscribe button down below. Smash it just once, because if you do it again, it'll unsubscribe you and that'll hurt my feelings. So just hit it once. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started with the repair. Now with any cooling system service, it is best to identify whether you have one or two leaks or whatever it may be so that you can service other components along with the system. Specifically why I'm talking about this is because there is also another small leak down below by the lower radiator hose. This was actually the first leak that I identified in the system before spotting the leak on the radiator. Generally with most leaks from a radiator, you can smell the coolant. It smells sort of weird and sweet, kind of acidic like it's an odd smell but once you realize what coolant smells like you'll never miss it of course we have that leak from the lower radiator holes we also have this guy here that popped up there was a slight crack and a little bit of residue like this which of course says leak then we remove the radiator cap of course with the engine being cold and checked and of course it was low on fluid so on a 2011 outback it's a little bit different there's a bunch more clips and stuff that you got to take off in order to get to the radiator clamps half of which is exposed here the other half is of course underneath this piece of plastic so we're going to need to remove these four clips on the bottom here and these four clips up top here best tool to do that is this sort of clip remover it works absolutely best and won't give you a headache you can see how easy that is Now, of course, don't forget these two guys here, the ones that I took out for this air duct, are slightly different. So don't mix them up. Pull your air duct out of place, and then you can wiggle your piece of plastic out of place. Here's another tip for you do-it-yourselfers out there. If you have a lot of brake clean, you'll get a lot of these caps. Don't toss them because you can take all your little fasteners and use these caps to hold them. Just pull back on the bumper slightly, or the grill, and just work this guy out like so. With that guy out of the way, you have clear access to the 12 millimeters here and here to pull these clamps off. Of course, go ahead now and fire them off. Go ahead, pull your retainers off. Now, boys and girls, what we are looking at is the top of the radiator fan and the 10 millimeter bolts that hold them in. Now, if you live in the rust belt like I do, rust tight is not your friend, it is your foe. However, WD-40, on the other hand, can be your friend. What you want to do is lather these bolts up with a nice healthy dose of WD-40 and pray to God, why isn't this can working? <laughs> All right, that really sucks. As I was saying before my WD-40 can displayed some technical difficulties, get your WD-40 and just spray this thing generously. Make sure that you get it on either side so that the WD-40 has its time to work. There are also two other bolts on the other side radiator fan which you should also lather up with WD-40. Yeah, these two guys here. Now, before you attempt getting these off, what I would suggest is getting a vice grip like this so that when you try to twist these off, if that little nut cert there essentially tries to twist within that plastic piece, you can grab the plastic piece with the vice grip. Have it on hand. What you want to do in order to try and get these guys out is not just hit it with a impact gun or air ratchet. Use a wrench. What you want to do is take your wrench, slowly twist, and then work back and forth. Luckily, this one's actually come out quite nicely. That's amazing. The other side wasn't so nice. Now that we have that bolt out of the way, the last bolt is, of course, blocked in by the overflow tank. So what you'll need to do is get a flat screwdriver to assist you in pushing this tab back here. Push the tab back at the same time, pushing the overflow bottle towards the engine, and then wiggle it out. Grab the holes up top here and just wiggle it loose. And then you can wiggle that guy out. Be sure to drain whatever coolant is left in there out and replace it with brand new coolant. With the overflow tank out of the way, go ahead and attempt getting rid of this bolt. Hopefully it doesn't break. 
This one's really tight. Now you can see there the plastic is working back and forth, so it's going to crack. Now here's a perfect example of what you do with your vice grip. Grab this guy and clamp it as tightly as possible without breaking the radiator. Of course that doesn't really matter because the radiator is crap anyhow. But if our new radiator hasn't come with new inserts, then we're gonna end up tapping and reusing these guys. So you also don't wanna give yourself more work by breaking the bolt off in there. You can see it's twisting now, and I'm lightly supporting the vice grip so that the plastic doesn't twist either. Just go back and forth, back and forth, and give it a little bit, and follow the same process until you get the bolt completely out. And if need be, go ahead and hit it with some more WD-40. Don't drop the wrench. And if you do, hope to God it hits the floor. That's how it's done, boys and girls. Now we're almost ready to get our fans out of this baby, but we have to disconnect them, of course, and get rid of this upper radiator hose so we can slide them out without trying to rip our hair out. What we want to do now is attempt to get this. It's easy on this side to disconnect it, which is the passenger side, of course, but if you try to do it on the driver's side, you will rip whatever little hair you have left on your head out. So I suggest sending the car up first, draining the fluid, and then disconnecting the radiator fans at that time. Then, once the fluid is low enough, you can take the upper radiator hose off without coolant spilling everywhere, and of course, pull the radiator fans out. Next step, boys and girls, send this thing up in the air. If you are doing this in your driveway at home without the use of a hoist and with a jack, make sure you employ the use of jack stands. Otherwise, you will forever be known as that guy who had his car drop on him while working on it in the driveway to save a few bucks which is a terrible way to go out in life don't do that to yourself we are currently looking at the underside of this thing boys and girls and you can see there there's our drain plug for our coolant on the radiator this here is one that requires a number three phillips bit in order to crank it loose now what i will say is these can sometimes be a real pain in the ass i don't personally like them very much they tend to break quite often so be very gentle if for whatever reason you're servicing your radiator and not replacing it because if that thing breaks It'll be a pain in the ass to get and you'll be shit out of luck for quite a while. Now, in order to access that and have it drain into one single place and not all over the place by hitting this tray, we're going to have to remove this tray. This tray is not just this section like on the older Outbacks. It is from here to the other side. So, let's show you how to do that. Remember, the process is exactly the same on either side. So, of course, I'll only be showing you the one side. What you'll need is, of course, our handy dandy clip remover. There is one clip here and there is a another clip on this side here. With your two clips removed, you're gonna get a 12 millimeter and fire this bolt off here. Again, if you live in the Rust Belt, everything that is a bolt seeks to destroy your happiness. So you can help yourself by employing the use of a hammer. Hammer that guy on, of course, and back and forth boys and girls will really go a long way because this guy is about to break I do not want to drill this thing out that there is rust type boys and girls um, the joy of no one ever and now all that's left is three clips on either side that'll take this tray off so you have this one here this guy here and that guy there you can use a flat screwdriver to do this job completely a Phillips number two bit is what is the pattern on the actual clip with your flat screwdriver, just wiggle out the top and then wiggle out the base of the clip. Repeat the process for the other two and you should be home free. Oh God. That's how that's done, boys and girls. Now do the other side and let the stupid thing fall out. Oh, what is that? I don't know what all this silvery shit is here. It just looks like a burrito wrapper or something. Uh, I don't know what the deal is there, boys and girls, but we're just gonna toss this in the garbage. Now with your cover out of the way, you can access this guy nice and comfortably with a number three Phillips bit. Go ahead and twist it just a bit to make sure that it is loose. Thankfully this one is going to come out without a hitch, I hope. Just twist it a bit, not all the way out. Go ahead and get your big old drain bucket, raise it up as high as possible, and then see if you can work the rest of this out without the screwdriver. And let her drain. 
Now I haven't taken the radiator cap off of the radiator just yet because that tends to make a mess. Now what you can do is get your drain pan as close as possible so that you don't have radiator coolant going everywhere and then you can take it off and let it drain peacefully. With that guy continuing to drain in the background, what you can see here is the leak from the thermostat housing. Most of the leak here is happening from the radiator hose itself. What causes this sort of reaction or this sort of situation specifically is when the acidity in the system starts to build. Now, this is something that's a lack of maintenance and unfortunately with Subaru and their maintenance schedule, they've been trying to get more cost friendly for the majority of their owners out there or people who have bought new cars. But this sort of thing can easily be prevented if it's recommended for service by the dealer. I'm not sure if this specific vehicle has just missed it or if it hasn't been recommended altogether. And specifically what I'm talking about is Subaru of North America or in Canada specifically, not recommending service to their CVT transmissions. They've been trying to cut back quite a bit and upping the interval for oil changes on their engine so that they can save the customer money. Not really the best thing to do in my opinion, especially if you're looking for longevity. If you're someone who's leasing the vehicle, you don't really care because, eh, well, that's the next guy's problem. Anyhow, what we'll need to do to remedy this issue is we're going to leave this clamp alone for now. We're going to take this 10 millimeter here off and there is another 10 millimeter just up top here on the opposing side of this, 180 degrees away, that you'll need to pull off as well to get this housing off. And then we're gonna take a wire wheel and clean the hell out of all this crap, separate the holes. We're gonna replace the clamp and clean up the holes inside. And hopefully the holes itself isn't in too bad shape. Otherwise we'll end up replacing it. Now with that guy continuing still to annoyingly drain into the big old drain pan bucket, what you gotta do now is tackle these transmission lines. There is CVT fluid in there, which is basically the same price as gold unfortunately so you want to do your best to lose as little as possible what i can tell you is the best method for removing these is a vice grip these clamps are as stated before in many of my other videos are a real pain in the ass and these ends love to fly off of any tool of choice even these guys here and bust your fingers wide open so be very cautious, especially with the bigger ones. That being said, grab a vice grip and clamp this guy and slowly move it back with your fingers far away from it. Now, if you don't have hose pinches that will clamp off the hose, therefore allowing very little ATF or CVT fluid, sorry, to leak out of this thing, you can use vice grips. Just don't clamp it extremely tight. What you want to do is clamp it just enough so that the fluid doesn't leak out. Now, if you don't have vice grips or a hose pinch that'll clamp off the hose is pull the hose off quickly, but make sure before you pull it off, of course, that you have a bolt that you can stick into this hole here on the hose side, therefore plugging the hose. Uh, another word of advice, don't kick the camera if you're recording it. Now when trying to get the holes off, you can use a curved jaw vice grip, just a small one, and gently, very gently, try to wiggle the holes back and forth. Don't reef on this, you will damage the holes. Just nice and slowly back and forth. Also moving the vice grip along the length of the holes where it attaches to the fitting. Just keep going back and forth, and then you can try and twist it by hand. Yeah, we need some more with the vice grip. You can't rush this process, you just gotta go nice and slow. Once you get it kind of loose, you can get a clip remover or a small pry bar and just sort of wiggle it back like this and that'll also help you with getting this thing off the goddamn car. I can see there, I got it loose now. So, just pull the hose from the back here. Okay, now, once you get close to the end of the pipe here, what you're going to do is employ one of the methods that I previously stated to pinch off the hose so that you don't have all kinds of gold or CVT fluid leaking out of your transmission line. I got uh, hose pinches because I'm fancy like that, you know what I mean? Uh, there we go. 
I just keep it elevated because the higher you have it, the better because you're gonna have a little bit less fluid leaking out of this stupid thing. Now, tackle the other side. I won't bore you with the process of showing you that, but it's much the same way, except there's a little bit less room. And there's also a lot more rust tight on this side. Of course, boys and girls, this is one of the many reasons that I advocate for people to buy manual transmissions. But unfortunately, no one listens and we're stuck with these stupid automatic things. Anyhow, I'll see you back in a bit. With your transmission lines out of the way, what I can tell you is you you should put your drain plug back in the radiator so that you don't have stupid little drips of coolant dripping all over your floor. Also, be aware that these hoses are held in by these little clips here. Uh, just sort of sections that are cut out of the radiator fan as well as a radiator. There's one right in front of this mount here that I can't show you on camera because obviously it is blocked out. So just move those guys out of the way. And now we can go ahead and remove the connectors for our radiator fan. On this side, which is barely visible, there's a little tab behind this hose here. That little tab there where my middle finger is, just pull down on it and slide that portion out towards the frame rail. And then, of course, on this side, it is much much easier to see. All you have to do is get a little pick like this, slide up on this tab here, and then pull this guy out. Of course, I can't fit my other hand in there because the camera is there. So pull that guy like that, grab this guy here, and oh my God. <sighs> the things I have to do for YouTube boys and girls, Jesus. Once you unhinge it, you can yank it out the rest of the way, like so. Uh. Don't you love salt, rust, and corrosion? It's just so much fun. Disconnect it, do the other side, and we'll see you up top. Now with the car back on the floor again, what we're going to do is disconnect our upper radiator hose. Clamp down on this thing with a vice grip. And of course, same advice as before, be careful with this clamp. I hate these goddamn clamps. With that guy out of the way, Wiggle your radiator hose back and forth until you get it off. Of course, with your upper radiator hose disconnected, you can now go ahead and pull your radiator fan assembly out. Just move your upper radiator hose out of the way. And there you go, friends. Then what you want to do is take this radiator fan and slide it over to the left side of the vehicle. Slide it over and, of course, pull it out. And now the only thing that's left to do is disconnect the bottom radiator hose. Now, of course, if I wasn't doing the thermostat gasket and housing and cleaning those two up, I would have shown you or told you to disconnect it from the radiator side. But we're going to take those two 10 millimeter bolts out and then, of course, pull out our radiator with the lower rad hose assembly attached to it. Now with our lower radiator hose disconnected, the only thing that's left to do here in order for us to get this thing out of the vehicle without having any real headaches is to move our two transmission lines out of the way. So essentially what we're going to do is just move them to the other side of this lower radiator hose so that we don't have them get tangled up or caught up on anything. Now with this guy, it's quite easy. It's so long you can just stick it up anywhere on top of the engine. Now with our two transmission lines out of the way, we're going to have to hold this guy like this this as far back as possible so that it doesn't collide with anything obviously. My preferred method for holding the top radiator hose out of the way is just to kind of sneak it in between the power steering hose up top here and this little cover. You're not trying to get in there you're just trying to get the cover to hold this guy out of the way. With all that being said we can go ahead now and yank our radiator out. Okay there we go. There you go boys and girls. Check that out. Yeah. Now earlier in the video you may have wondered why it is that I didn't wash the engine bay when I told you I was going to get rid of all the disgustingness in this engine bay. I'll tell you why boys and girls. Because you could see all that crap that was on the radiator which means that there's going to be crap in the front of the condenser as well. What I can do is get in here with my power washer now without the repair being done and wash all the crap that would sit in the condenser quite freely without having the radiator or new radiator in the way. We're also going to have access to all the crap in the front of the engine here, so I can get rid of a lot more dirt. And of course, you must have guessed it by now, but our next step is to push this heaping pile of Subaru outside in the back of the shop and power wash the engine bay. Wish me luck, boys and girls. It is currently one degree. Today's daytime high is you might see goddamn flurries. So, yeah. 
Now for me, before I push this thing outside, what I'm going to do is take all the loose components off of the engine bay and prepare them for wash as well. And of course, get rid of any loose bolts or nuts or fasteners that you took off in the process of doing the work to the radiator, and then we'll go ahead and wash this thing. Here's your tip of the day, boys and girls. Make sure if you are in the same situation that I am in and you have to push the vehicle, make sure that you push the vehicle and do not start it if you have a CVT. The reason being is because all of the liquid gold that is the CVT fluid that is in your transmission will leak out. When it leaks out, you will also destroy your CVT transmission. In the process, destroying your hopes of dreams of having a happy day. So don't make that mistake. Make sure you push the vehicle and never start it when your CVT lines are disconnected because you will cry. If you want to see a grown man cry, that's one of the ways to make him cry is to make him pay money for his own stupidity. Okay, now enough said. Let's push this thing out. Now, boys and girls, Word of advice before you start blasting, make sure your engine is not hot. Second, make sure you don't use any harsh chemicals. Number three, do not blast excessively any electrical components, especially if there is a temperature differential between what is currently outside and what is the part itself. Let's make this a number four. Don't blast it on days when it's extremely cold because you'll freeze your ass off. But this is my job and I got no choice. For you do-it-yourselfers at home, pick a nicer day. You should see the water, it's black <laughs> when you blast the AC condenser. So yeah, you can see some of the benefits as to really looking up close when you're doing this sort of stuff. Uh, we, we see there that someone has forgotten to connect the power steering uh, pressure sensor for whatever reason. Anyhow, let's uh, finish the rest of the condenser and we'll push this bad boy back in. <laughs> Now, of course, before you get back to work on this thing, do yourself a favor, get your blow gun and blow everything that you can dry in the engine bay. Now, the best advice I can give you before you go ahead and throw your new radiator in is to make sure you compare your new radiator to your old one. Make sure you have the correct radiator. If you don't, that's really gonna suck. If you do, you can go ahead with the next step. The next step is to verify that all these are tight uh, from the factory. What happens generally is when you get these things, uh, the majority of the time, they are great there are no issues but the odd time that you choose not to check that these fittings are nice and tight or that your drain plug is nice and tight or there um, you find out the hard way when you put it into the car and it starts to leak and all sorts of fun stuff which you won't like very much so do yourself that favor and double check everything to make sure that it is all good before you throw it into the car ours is good of course so our next step is going to be to take care of that lower radiator holes and the aluminum piece where the thermostat is then we can go ahead and put it all back together now what you're gonna do is remove this clamp go ahead and get a big enough vice grip and then you can wiggle the holes until it breaks free like that and pull it off. You can see this side here is fine. There's nothing to be done there. What we're going to do is pull this clamp completely off and replace it with a normal worm clamp. And then on this side, we're going to yank the housing off, get rid of all that crud, give it a nice layer of paint on this side here so it doesn't look like complete crap. And then we're going to put some silicone before we put it on. We're also going to be replacing the thermostat gasket on the engine. Ugh. Nice compressor. Yeah, I gotta love these stupid fucking clamps. There we go. And just twist. Yeah. So, basically, we're gonna grind all that scudge and sludge off. 
we're also going to grind all that crap out of there. Now, if our radiator hose is punctured from this crap, which can happen, we will then replace this thing. I find the best way to get the crud and crap out of here is with a small screwdriver like this and a round file like this. What you want to do is basically just gently kind of scrape off all this crap, like so. If you continue to do that, you should be in okay shape. All right. With the hose, you should end up with a result like this. As you can see, most of the white stuff and crud is gone. It's a little bit rough, but I don't see any protrusions. If your hose is cheap enough, you can go ahead and replace it. This one here isn't in stock, so we're gonna go ahead and reuse it. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just for precautionary measure if you want to replace it. Now, in regards to the aluminum piece, what you want to do is scrape off most of the big chunks and crap with your flat screwdriver, and then go ahead and get a wire wheel or wire brush and just etch the rest of the aluminum aluminum now you should end up with a result like this for the aluminum piece before paint just make sure you get rid of all the dirt and crap that's on this thing and then you can go ahead and paint it after you paint it you should end up with a result like this now remember boys and girls the reason why we are painting it is not so that it looks pretty it is so that it doesn't corrode now before you go ahead and put the thing on right after you paint it make sure you rub off the paint that's on this side here and in here and then wipe it down clean so that you don't have any zinc primer getting into your goddamn cooling system okay boys and girls let's go ahead and let this thing dry now essentially our next step in this process is to go ahead pull the thermostat out of course there will be some residual coolant inside the system so make sure you get a catch basin then go ahead and clean up the surface just the same as you did with the piece that mates to it make sure that it's clean of any debris or hard coolant go ahead replace the thermostat if you choose to or the gasket my experience the thermostats are fairly good on these things I don't usually replace them should be fine in case you're wondering uh, this is what the thermostat and gasket look like. Disgusting. Make sure you replace the gasket and clean all that crud inside of there um, in the crease where the thermostat gasket came out of. Clean all that crap out. Now, of course, if you want to avoid cleaning that situation altogether, what you can do is replace your water pump, which the sad part is I might actually be doing the time belt water pump on this thing eventually, which would really suck because I'd be replacing this thermostat gasket again. Now, with your new thermostat gasket in place, make sure you you have it placed properly there are four notches make sure the notch coincides with this little piece here on the thermostat so that you don't get any ear locks remember this top this portion of the thermostat here with this little piece should be at the top of the water pump when reinstalling it now before you go ahead and reinstall the thermostat and your brand new gasket make sure you put a layer of silicone on the gasket on the back and then we'll put a layer of silicone on the aluminum piece that we have cleaned up. Now, if you want to avoid this situation altogether where you have issues like this with your cooling system, change your coolant every 50,000 kilometers or two or three years. Don't let it go longer than that. It'll make your life a pain. Now, this is a terrible angle because there's obviously a whole bunch of stuff in the way, but with your thermostat housing installed, what you're going to do is make sure you torque these bolts here and here in steps. So what I usually do is run them up by hand and then I torque it to six foot pounds and then I alternate when I get to six to eight foot pounds and then I finish off at 10 foot pounds so you do six six eight eight 10 and 10 and you're good to go make sure when you're putting your new worm clamp on you put it on like this so that this section here of the clamp is nice and accessible now we can lower this bad boy and put the radiator in now boys and girls our next step is to route our transmission lines back into place underneath the lower radiator hose of course that isn't going to be hard because the thing is not bolted down so we can easily move it out of the way so put your first hose down and then route them underneath with that done you should have your grommets that receive your radiator still on the car if they came off with the car make sure you locate them and put them back into the body of the vehicle now go ahead grab your radiator and slide it into place carefully how the hell did that come off great
With your radiator sitting in place properly, you can go ahead and attach your lower radiator hose. With your radiator in place, make sure you do not leave your upper radiator hose up because if it somehow comes down and smashes your radiator and that clamp cracks a hole in this goddamn top tank, you're not going to be a very happy camper. So our next step, put this thing up, button up the bottom radiator hose and the other two little transmission lines that contain liquid gold. Now what I like to do when securing the clamp to the radiator is kind of have it in this region here, get a little ball flex socket and 8 mil is what's required for my application here and then just tighten it home verify that your hose is on all the way and that your clamp is in the right position remember boys and girls don't be overly tight it's just a worm clamp now you can go ahead and do the other side just make sure the hose is all the way on and then just tighten it up Do the twist test to make sure it's nice and tight. Now for the tranny line, I mean gender neutral line, what you want to do is employ the use of a new clamp. I should have figured out how I was going to put it on first. Slide it into place and then slide the line over. With the line over, remove your hose pinching pliers and push the line all the way on. Then go ahead, straighten the clamp up so you can access the bolt nice and easily and tighten it home. Make sure your glove doesn't get caught between the clamp line and the holes. And just give it a little bit of a twist test, make sure it's nice and snug. Then you can go ahead and slide these lines back into place on the radiator. And then when we put the rad fan in, we'll have to send it up one more time to get these guys into place on the radiator fan. Now we can go ahead and slide in our radiator fans. Make sure they're sitting nice inside the radiator. Go ahead, grab the other side. Make sure that you get the fans right because of course you should have this side on the left side of the vehicle so that you have somewhere to mount your overflow tank. Slide this guy into place. When you're sliding down on this side, what you wanna do is grab the transmission lines, move them out of the way so that you can slide your radiator fan into place. Then connect your radiator fan. With your radiator fans connected, you can now, of course, go ahead and bolt them back up. Remember, before installing the bolts that hold in your radiator fans, make sure you tap and anti-seize them. God damn compressor. Just make sure you run them up by hand, and then you can go ahead and tighten them down with your ratchet. Nothing too tight. Um, there is no torque spec for this sort of stuff. Just nice and snug. Make sure that it's not going to fall out. Make sure that you don't break anything. That, my friends, is the correct torque spec. Then, of course, don't forget your overflow tank. Now, boys and girls, here is another tip. Before you go ahead and put your overflow tank into the car, make sure you fill the thing up because if you've owned a Subaru in the past or worked on one, it is damn near impossible to see where the hell the level is, especially when it's down in the engine bay. Do yourself a favor, fill it up off of the car and if you've replaced the vehicle's radiator or any part of the cooling system, overfill it just a bit. That way, you don't have to consistently monitor this stupid thing with a flashlight because it's not transparent. Slide it into place. Now, what you want to do is slide that that little piece there in the place and then clip it home boys and girls close the cap and look at that people might even think I'm a real mechanic now you can go ahead grab your radiator brackets that retain your radiator to the car and put them back into place if you live in the rust belt don't forget to tap and anti-seize these two guys here and then just fire them home if you're looking for a torque spec, I would say 15 pounds should be more than enough to hold those guys in forever. Okay, boys and girls, now we can go ahead and reattach our upper radiator hose. If your radiator hose is being difficult, make sure you employ the use of some WD-40 to slide it on nice and easy. We're also now going to get some clips that hold this thing in place permanently because this continuously comes off. We're also going to put a clip on this thing because someone's not put it back. With our clips in place, we can go ahead now, put our clamp back on the top radiator hose.
Remember, be very careful when wiggling this guy into place. If you are reusing like I just did on the top, match where the clamp was sitting on the hose prior to you taking it off. Now, we can go ahead and dump some fluid in the radiator. Now, the best advice I can give you is to make sure that you go ahead and get a funnel that fits your radiator neck when filling it up. It makes your life easy, especially when you're about to bleed the thing. Go ahead, get the appropriate radiator fluid. I got the 50-50 premix from Subaru. Also, puncture the jug for the radiator fluid like so, so that you're not pouring obscene amounts in at once and having it spill everywhere. Then just start adding radiator fluid, boys and girls. With your radiator full with fluid, what you can do now is go ahead and start putting the plastics back that you previously removed. Just take your time and slide them into place gently, because of course they are plastic and they will break if you are overly aggressive with them. With it in place, go and get your clips and put the clips back home. Oh, come on, only a dick compressor. And then, don't forget the last two that are different from all the others. Just put your duct in first and put these guys back. The only problem with me putting these clips back now is that they're all disgustingly dirty and not clean like the rest of them. So take a microfiber cloth and just wipe them down. Then walk over to your upper radiator hose and just give it a wiggle. Make sure that you have bubbles coming out and there's enough fluid in there. Then go ahead and just top up as needed. We'll send this car up in the air, put the under tray on. We'll get this thing off the hoist and start bleeding it. Of course, boys and girls, the last thing to do underneath here is to put this tray back into place. Don't forget to anti-seize your bolts and replace whatever broken clips you may have. Now you can go ahead, start the vehicle up, run it, and bring it up to operating temperature. The best way to monitor whether the vehicle is up at operating temperature is to make sure that you have a scan tool, any sort of cheap scan tool, connected to your vehicle. You want to look at the engine coolant temperature to make sure that you don't exceed 100 degrees Celsius because it'll hurt your engine. <laughs> Now, of course, just monitor the temperature and the level of the coolant in the radiator and let it warm up to operating temperature. You'll know it's at operating temperature by keeping an eye on your scanner. Also, make sure that your climate control is all the way to the hot side and that you have it on so that you know you have heat coming into the vehicle, which means that you have coolant going into your heater matrix or heater core. If your vehicle has come up to operating temperature and hasn't surpassed 100 degrees Celsius and your radiator fans have come on, you are good to go. Verify that you have heat inside the cabin as long as you do and your fans have come on you can put your radiator cap on what you're going to do is the following morning you will make sure that the vehicle is cold then you can verify that you have coolant inside the cooling system by removing the radiator cap make sure that the cooling system is cold and the engine is not hot when you check the coolant inside of the radiator well boys and girls that's all she wrote for the outback if you like the video please like share and subscribe don't forget to hit the notification bell and as always Thanks for watching. We will see you in the next one. Oh, for fuck's sakes, why is this so hard? As you can see, besides the radiator, this vehicle is... <clears throat> Of course, before I get started with today's video, do me a big favor and hit that subscribe button. That, 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 that fuck. <laughs> or that, it's a weird sort of that, that I pose where it meets the thermostat gasket down below. You can see a little bit of, what, what did I just say? Damn it. Where it meets that little cup for the housing. Oh, for fuck's sakes. Like this up in the top corner of the screen. Holy fuck, that's nice and stiff. We're going to get a screwdriver for that bitch and reframe. Fuck, what am I saying? Don't drop things when you want silence on camera. I don't not. Like there's some sort of rat nest or some shit. What the fuck is that? Now, I haven't taken the cap off upstairs. Perfect. Now, I haven't taken the cap off of the vehicle. Oh, goddamn, Jim. You're gonna have to watch that from far back because I don't want that cooling on my lens. It's a pain in the ass to clean off. Well, that's enough of this. As well as the hose. And, or no, we're not gonna replace the hose. Hey, the fuck did I just say? <laughs> Employ the use of one of those messes. Method. That sounded like Chinese or something. Tell you, are there are. Remove the connect.
out towards the frame wheel. Ah, oh, fucking focus. You better slide, motherfucker. Our lower, or fuck sakes. What the hell is holding this thing? And today's daytime high is a fuck it's cold. Before you push this thing outside, or whatever, I don't know how you're doing it at home, but what? Uh, shut up, Jimmy. Oh, I showed the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> What's this thing called again? Of course there will some make sure that this little piece here the little I don't even know what you call that with your nude water with that uh. now what I like to do when you ah fuck this is YouTube I'm supposed to make it look easy we can now go ahead and glab glab oh boy jeez not a linguist that's for sure now you can go ahead grab the what the fuck are these things again damn it um Fuck, what's the name? Radiator fucking thingy my bobbers? Ah, for fuck's sake. Also, puncture your radiator, put in your plastics back that you remove. Don't forget this thing. They are a valuable port, port, part. What the fuck am I saying? Also a good idea to have some hardware so that you can put this fucking thing back into place without it falling on your head. When heating up the vehicle, it should not pass. Oh, I already said that. And you haven't surpassed 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Or no, that's the wrong that's the wrong thing well boys and girls that's all she wrote for the outback if you like the video please like share and subscribe don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss one ah oh, fuck